Hey Google, how do I make work more enjoyable? You know, if you love what you do, then you never work a day in your life. Hey. Hey Jacob, about that expense report. Huh? Hey Google, can you search for jobs in my area? So hopefully the last couple weeks from Hey Google, you've realized what not to ask. Google, and so we felt that it would be fitting that we cap off the last week talking about a four-letter word. If you were to say, hey, Google, what is a four-letter word? There's probably some words that you'd have to block your eyes, shut down your, your computer or your laptop, and there's some other four-letter words that it pops up, and you're like, oh, man, I love that four-letter word. But today's four-letter word, as soon as I say it, maybe there's some stress that begins to ensue inside of your heart, and anxiety all of a sudden starts to grip you. And then there's others that will hear this word, and all of a sudden, there's just going to there, there's gonna be some butterflies, rainbows, and unicorns that just come out. Today's four-letter word, you guessed it, is W-O-R-K. We're going to be talking about work, and I think we need to pray first. Father, I thank you so much for this weekend. I thank you that you are already at work in our lives. I pray, God, that you would do what only you can do in this moment, in this time, in this season, in our lives. Jesus' name, amen and amen. Turn to someone next to you and say, work it out. Oh, come on. You can turn to the other person that you were scared to talk to and say, work it out. There you go. I, I hear in all of our locations maybe some little flair in, in that. You know, there's a, there's a study that shows that if you are an employer, that if you wanted to attract younger employees into your company that you have to exhibit some form of flexibility. Flexibility in work hours, meaning there's some flexibility on when you can come in and when you can uh, leave for work. Flexibility in using social media. Flexibility in using your phone. Benefits also come in there and benefits in, in uh, travel, benefits in volunteering. And, and this is a good thing because it's supposed to increase profit because it increases productivity. And that's a good thing for employers, but yet there's another study right now that is showing that to be the wrong thing. On average right now, they're saying that 77% of employees, for you employers out there, that's close to 8 out of 10 employees will spend close to 1 to 2 hours a day on their cell phone, on social media, watching pornography, doing online banking, doing gambling, handling personal business on work time, on the works dime. And, and during the month of March, the NCAA tournament has a basketball tournament. And during this season, it's called March Madness. But for businesses, it's actually madness because they're losing money. There's on average a loss of productivity of $2.5 billion dollars. Billions of dollars down the drain because of brackets and basketball. And so for an employee, their response is, hey, what are you doing at work? None ya. Hey, I've never heard of that thing. What is none ya? None ya business. Mind your business, Jay. Mind your business, Google. Get off my search history. Doesn't matter what I do at work so long as I get my work done. Doesn't matter how I got my work done. Doesn't matter if I cut the corner, doesn't matter if I use misconduct, doesn't matter what I say about my boss, did I get my work done? Mind your business. But for an employer, they're saying, hey Google, how do I cut the pay for my employees? Hey Google, how do I rip apart all the benefits from my company? Hey Google, how do I overwork my guys? Because I don't care if you gotta stay here all night so long as you get your job done. I don't care if your family doesn't see you today so long as you get your project done. And the workplace seems to be the most stressful places for many of us. Contention, competition, and it's got a cutthroat environment about it because the ends justify the means. And it's almost worse when you consider Christians in the workplace as well. Let me ask you today, how do you stand out at your job? 
How, how do you stand out at your business? Unfortunately, it seems like the only thing that distinguishes someone who professes to be a Christ follower and someone who doesn't at their workplace is what they do on a Sunday morning. What would happen if Jesus went to work for you? Would the company make profit or would the company plunder? Would, 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 would the company's workplace be a little bit more pleasing to go to or would there be a lot more backbiting? Would there be a lot more gossiping? Or would there be a lot more talking negatively about the boss or the business? What would happen if Jesus was your boss or if Jesus was your employer? Would you come home feeling a lot more filled up or would you feel a lot more drained? Would you dread waking up the next morning or would you get fired up to go back to work? See, the book of Proverbs, it gives us an outline of how to use wisdom at work, how to use the wisdom in our work ethic and our business practices. And the author, King Solomon, known to be the most wealthiest man in the world, but one of the wisest people to ever step foot on this planet, he wrote the book of Proverbs not just with good ideas, but with God ideas on how to live skillfully using your skill and how to use wisdom while you're at work. And you see, you and I, we, we play the fool. Every time we cut the corner, every time we use misconduct, every time we handle ourselves in a way that is not God-pleasing. And the book of Proverbs chapter 6 kind of gives us a little bit of an outline on how to use wisdom at work. He says, take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. I love that. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. But you lazy bones, how long will you sleep? And when will you wake up? A little extra sleep, a little bit more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. What are worthless and wicked people like? They're constant liars, signaling their deceit with a wink of an eye, a nudge of the foot, or the wiggle of the fingers. Their perverted hearts plot evil, and they constantly stir up trouble. But they will be destroyed suddenly, broken in an instant beyond all hope of healing. And you may be wondering and asking, Jay, how in the world is this going to be life-giving for me? How is this life-giving for my business? How is this life-giving for my workplace? Follow me here. Solomon is making a distinction between two kinds of workers, a wise worker and a wicked worker, a worthless worker. In a world where outcomes determine your incomes and input determines your output, too often we find ourselves in the rat race and fall into the trap that the amount of work we put in is due and determined by the worth we put on the work. Let me say that again. The amount of work you put in at times is determined by the worth we put on the work, which means there is a price tag to our productivity, a price tag to our performance, and it's equivalent to the value we placed on the product. Well, I don't see much worth in this work, so I'm going to put very little effort into it, and perhaps that same worth is on me too. Maybe I'm not worth much either. But what if that wasn't the case? What if it wasn't the worth of the work that determined the work from the worker? What if it was the worth of the worker that determined their work? How do we then use wisdom in our workplace and our business practices? This is the principle that pops out of the pages of Scripture, the pages of Proverbs. And if you have something to write with, I want to encourage you to take some notes. In your program, there's a place to take notes at all our locations. Here is the big idea that Solomon's trying to allow us to grab hold of, and it's this. Mind your business. Come on, say that with me. Say, mind your business. Come on, I need to mind my business. You need to mind your business. We need to mind our business. Now, obviously, I'm using a play on words here, but the, the Proverbs and the wisdom of Solomon is teaching us how to live skillfully using skills, 
how to use wisdom in our workplaces, and we need to be mindful of our business. We need to be mindful of the work that we are doing. We need to be mindful in, in putting diligence and dedication and devotion in the duties that we do. And Solomon is saying that you and I, we can gain wisdom in our work from what seems to have very little worth from us, an ant. An ant doesn't have a governor, doesn't have a ruler, but yet it wakes up, gets food, and goes to work. It gathers in the summer and, and, and gathers provisions in the winter. It wakes up, gets food, and bring it home. It wakes up, gets food, and bring it home. We can't deny that a, an ant is very much mindful of its business. No matter what, what we think its business is, no matter how mundane we may think it is, it wakes up, it gets the food, and brings it back home. It doesn't matter if it's snowing, raining, sleeting outside. I'm not taking a lunch break. I'm going to get my food. I'm going to bring it back home. And the reason why an ant is so mindful of its business is because it lives its life with such great mission. You see, this mission and a lack of mission will result in a lack of motion. A lack of mission will result in a lack of motivation, mindless thinking. And whenever your mission and your purpose is unclear in your life, it's easy to settle and miss the mark. Let me explain to you. When we are living missionless, living mindless of our business that we need to be minding, it's easy for us to settle on making a living but yet miss on making a life. It's easy for us, if we are mindless of our business and living missionless lives, it's easy for us to settle on adding years to our life, but yet we miss adding life to our years. So what causes us to miss the mark? What causes us to mind a different kind of business? You and I, we have an internal pull that causes us to go a different kind of business, causes us to be blinded of our business falling into the rat race and the trap of, of ending up working like the worthless worker, where it says the wages of a worthless worker is poverty will pounce on it, scarcity will begin to scare it. And this nature is what biblical authors call sin. Sin is any action, any thought, any intention that goes contrary to who God is, and this sin, it creates in us a separation between us and God, as a matter of fact, sin is an archery term, which literally means to miss the mark. And we are minding that business, not knowing that the wages of this work is actually destruction and death. And God saw that, and he loved you and I so much that he ended up minding our business. And he sent Jesus from the cross. He moved Jesus. He commissioned Jesus with motivation and moved him on a mission to rescue us from sin and shame and the grips of the wages of eternal death. And so Jesus came to die in order to defeat death. All of our shame, our guilt, our conceit, our insecurity, everything was heaped upon his life and in his death. He defeated death once and for all. So that those that will believe in Jesus by faith will be forgiven. Not just forgiven, though, set free. Because Jesus came, rose from the grave, defeating sin, death, and hell, so that those that will believe in him will be, will be granted new life through the power of his resurrection. Literally what Jesus did for us. He took the shift that you and I could not work. He worked for us before we could even work for God. He gave us his paycheck, the promise of heaven, the promise of new life, before any single one of us could actually perform and produce for God. And, and so Jesus, Jesus, through his wages, gave us a new worth. Look, I don't, I don't know what you're going to go into work receiving, what kind of wages you're receiving, whether you consider it monetarily a little or a lot. No one can ever add to you or take away from you that will ever remove the worth that you have in God. And because that cannot dictate your worth, it won't change how you work. But because of the work of Jesus Christ, it changed our worth. And now if we know our worth, we can put in the work no matter what the work may be. 
We can put into work whatever it is because now we have a new worth in Jesus. We don't have to receive a wage before we actually start to work. Once we understand, I've already got paid. I've already got a blessing. I don't need the benefits. I've already got paid in peace, and I'm going to take that worth, and I'm going to bring it to my job. I've already got paid in joy. I've already got paid in forgiveness. I've already got paid in new life, and that is my worth, and now I can bring that worth to my work, and I can, I can turn it into whatever work that God has me to work right now. And once you know your worth, you can put in the work no matter what that work is. Back in the day when I was younger, there used to be a saying, act your age, not your shoe size. There's a new saying for us this weekend, act your wage. Come on, turn to someone next to you and say, act your wage. Act your wage. There is a new wage that you got, a new wage because you've got a new worth. And because you got a new worth, it changes how you work. Jesus, his spirit, enters our spirit, and the spirit that used to have a different business, the spirit that causes us to have a wage of, of, of punishment and persecution moves out, and a new wage, a new worth moves in. I, I don't have to accept that wage anymore. I've been promoted. I don't have to accept that lie anymore. I, I've been set free. I got a new life. I got a new worth in Jesus. I can mind my business. I can act my wage. And so how do I mind my business? How do you mind your business? I want to give you guys two complimentary thoughts this weekend. The first is this. Mind your business by minding God's business. Proverbs says this. Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer gathering food for the winter. But you lazy bones, how long will you sleep? And when will you wake up slumber? A little folding of the hands to rest, then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. So Solomon is saying that an ant does not have a governor to say, hey, get up and go to work. It doesn't have a supervisor that's watching its every move over its shoulder saying, hey, you need to wake up and go to work. But yet an ant wakes up and goes to work. Why? Why would you go to work when no one's expecting you to go to work? It's because an ant has been uniquely hardwired for hard work, created to work hard. Now, more than a master, more than a ruler, more than any of the, the supervisors and bosses, the almighty creator God worked extremely hard, crafted and created this little creature to be on mission. And this mission caused its, to, caused its life to be in motion, caused its life to be motivated. This is what I've been created to do. And the same God created you and I worked extremely hard to turn our work into something far greater. And what Proverbs is saying is that God's business must now become our business and when God's business becomes our business, our work ethic and our business practices are held to a much higher standard because we serve an audience of one. As, as people of God, we have to understand who we are working for. You may be saying, but Jay, I work for Google, or Jay, I work for Apple, hey, Jay, I work for Walmart, or no matter who you think you work for as a Christ follower, you don't work for them. You work for God. And as a Christ follower, every work that we do is God's work. The Apostle Paul, he writes a letter to the people of Kalos thousands of years later, telling them and instructing them, this is where you need to devote your duties to. This is how you turn your work into an act of worship. In Colossians chapter 3, this is what he says. Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord. Not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Whatever you do. Say that with me. Say whatever. Whatever. That includes everything that you do. Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart. That means every, everything that we do within our work, work practices and our business practices all goes in correlation with our relationship with Christ. And when we begin to look at our boss, when we begin to look at our staff, when we begin to look at our supervisors, our clients, and our customers in the same manner that we would treat them and look at them as we do God, because God is our boss, God is our supplier, God is our supervisor, he's our client and our customer, 
your work begins to turn into worship. Come on, some of us don't need to learn how to sing to turn worship into our work or, or, or work into worship. Some of us, we just need to say nicer words while we're there. Some of us, in order for us to turn worship, an atmosphere of worship in our work, we don't need to learn how to crash the drums like, like some of our drummers do all across our campuses. Some of us, we need to conduct our businesses in a way it's going to bring glory to God. We don't need to learn how to, 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 to write music or make music or read music to, to learn to bring a worship atmosphere in our, in our work. We just need to live mind, not, not mindless, but missional in our business, mindful of our business for God. We need to trust God as our provider. We need to trust God as our supplier. We need to trust God as our, as our, as our boss, not our paycheck and our business, which requires some hard decisions it means that because we're minding God's business, that we're going to do the right thing no matter how much it costs us. That we're going to follow the word of God at work regardless of our outcome. That means that it's going to be only God's review that matters and only his approval that matters because we understand that work is a gift. Maybe we just need to redefine what work is for us and understand that it is a gift from God and how we work is our worship back to him. When our business is to serve God and obey God, you know what God does? He blesses that business because that's God's business. And God blesses those who serve him and those who obey him. And when we understand who we're working for and why we're working for him, it changes how we work. And it leads me to my last point is this. Mind your business by being a servant of God. Mind your business by being a servant of God. Proverbs tells us this. It says, but you lazy bones, how long will you sleep? And when will you wake up? A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. What are worthless and wicked people like? They're constant liars, Signaling their deceit with a wink of an eye, a nudge of the foot, or the wiggle of the fingers. And their perverted hearts plot evil, but they constantly stir up trouble. But they will be destroyed suddenly, broken in an instant beyond all hope of healing. As servants of God, we have to begin to look at ourselves as employees of God. Any profitable employee will always increase productivity for its company. Any worthy employee is always going to increase profit for its business. And what Solomon is saying, a worthless worker is literally a worker who's not profitable. And here's the wages of that work. And here's how they begin to work. That they're going to handle their businesses deceitfully because they're liars. They're going to cut corners. They're going to use misconduct because they're liars. They're, they're, they're deviants. They're divisive because their hearts, their hearts are perverted. The reason why their habits are wrong is because their hearts are unconditioned. They're, they're going to begin to stir up dissension. They're going to stir up discord in the workplace. They're going to backbite. They're going to, they're going to turn each other against one another because their sole mission is to, is to sow bad seeds, is to stir up trouble. And if you and I, we were to ever handle ourselves in that kind of manner, you and I would be unprofitable too. And Solomon was saying, more than just not making any profits, there's a punishment for that kind of work. Because a worthless worker will always rob God of the worship from their work because they don't understand their worth. And when you and I, we understand the worth that we have, it changes the work that we do. When we understand we have the wages of heaven, it changes our worth. We become not just servants of God, we become worthful people. And worthful workers will always look for work that's going to worship God. 
There's areas of your business right now. There's areas of, of, of your, your work right now that perhaps God is looking at and saying, how can you turn that into worship? How can I go into Monday morning? How can I go into Wednesday afternoon with a mindset of knowing I've got a new worth and therefore I've got a new, I got a new work ethic coming your way. I got a new business practice coming your way because I'm going to turn my work into worship. A servant of God understands that you and I, we have been hardwired for hard work and that is a Christian Christian virtue. There's a mark of godliness. Therefore, as a servant of God, we, we start looking at diligence. That's my duty. That's your duty. You start, you start clinging on to character more than you cling on to currency because in, in God's economy, in God's company, character is the capital. You, you start chasing integrity more than you chase income. You start pursuing the praises of God rather than the approval and the promotion of man. As a servant of God, there's no other person that we serve but him, the audience of one. But as a servant of God, we serve others. And how we service others, our customers, our clients, our bosses, our supervisors, should be a direct lineup with who we're ultimately serving, God. Martin Luther King once said this, it says, whatever your life's work is, do it well. Even if it doesn't fall into the category of the one of the so-called big professions, do it well. As one college president said, a man should do his job so well that the living and the dead and the unborn could do it no better. If it falls to your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures, like Shakespeare wrote poetry, like Beethoven composed music, sweep streets so well that all the host of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here live the great street sweeper who swept his job well. Let it be said of us that we worked well. Let it be said of us that there was a resounding sound of worship in our workplaces because we understand and grab hold of a worth that could not be worked for. It was worked for us. Let it be said that there lived the great cashier. Let it be said that there lived the great school teacher. Let it be said that there lived the great policeman. Let it be said that there lived the great postal office worker. Let it be said that we worked well and we turned our work into worship because we understand our worth. Let that be said. Perhaps you're here and you're experiencing a different kind of wage for your life, not just physically, but spiritually. Experiencing a, a wage where you've been bankrupt spiritually and, and, and scarcity has scared you to death. Perhaps there is a new wage and a new worth that God wants you to receive today. Perhaps there's a new business that he wants you to mind. And, and today, if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, would that be your response today? Would that be the response today saying, God, I received the wages of new life and eternal joy found in the presence of God forever, the promise of heaven. I received that wage today for a work I could not do, but Jesus Christ worked for me, and that has now become my worth. Would that be your response today? To say, I'm, re I'm, I'm repenting, I'm turning away from, from that kind of business that led me astray, led me away from God. And today, I want to receive a new worth and a new wage. I want to change the way I work through the power of the Spirit of God in me. If you're here today and you've already made that decision to follow Jesus, what areas of your work right now, perhaps you need to hand over to God to turn into worship? In our little locations, would you stand with us? I want to pray for us right now because I believe that God wants to motivate us. God wants to move us to be a people of mission, a people that is mind, mindful of his work. And after our prayer, our team is going to lead us into a song. But right now, we're, we're going to declare, declare that, that God is the God of the promise. God literally gave us the promise of the paycheck before we could perform for him. God literally gave us the, the worth and the wage of the work that we could not do. And so, therefore, our work now is, is, is an act of worship. Would you pray with me, Father? I thank you so much. I thank you that, God, you created and crafted each and every one of us, hardwired each and every one of us to work hard. 
But God, it's not just for the express uh, purpose of work, but it's the express purpose of worship. And so, God, right now, with a resounding worship to you, God, we thank you for the worth that you've given us. We thank you for the wages that changes the way that we work. So, God, in all our locations, God, would you, would you work inside of us to turn everything that we do, everything that we lay our hands to, into worship. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We hope that you have enjoyed today's experience. We also hope that this message has challenged you and will encourage you in the upcoming week. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ today, congratulations. Welcome to the family and welcome home. One of the most important first steps that you can take is by letting us know. You can click the prayer tab or you can visit us at lifehousechurch.org. And if this message or ministry has blessed you in any way, feel free to partner with us financially. You can click on the Give tab or you can visit our website and click Give. We are so thankful that you joined us and we are thankful that you are part of our extended family. We can't wait to see you back here next week.